faster, more temple-oriented strategy than you're going to find in most of the sealed decks. On Dan's side, again, he has a Mardu deck, and he has a copy of Soren Solemn Visitor, the Planeswalker. You know, interesting to see exactly how good that card's going to be as we do begin things here in round number one. Gindy going to push himself up to 21 right away. You've got Baker going to play a Plains and a Swamp. And Gindy will take his second turn, draws a copy of Singing Bell Strike. He will play a Plains. And this right here, what we see on the first two turns of the game, nothing happening. That's not going to be unusual. Well, Charles's deck is a little bit more on the aggressive side, so this is a bit of a miss for him. He has two copies of uh, Anok Bondkin, which is one of the premium two drops in the format, but he missed. And it's our first morph of the day. Now, we can't forget the morph rule, too. Because, uh, you know, I, I have a, a sinking feeling this may happen. But one thing that's gonna, that you have to do with morphs is you have to reveal them at the end of the game. That's very, very important. Because you have to make sure, of course, that it was actually a morph creature. And Daniel here with one... Uh, this is a pretty innocuous card on the surface of it, the Unyielding Krumar. But again, remember, three threes are much better in this format than they traditionally are because of all the morphs floating around. The Krumar, of course, can get a little bit bigger. This is going to be revealing the Salt Road Patrol. Watcher of the Roost is going to allow Gindy to gain two life, and the Roost is going to come in for two in the air. So that's a 2-1 flyer, and he's going to push himself up to 23. So he's getting the beatdowns going very nicely here. We alluded to this cycle earlier in the broadcast, the cycle of uncommon morphs that all unmorph for revealing. Watcher of the Roost, not the trickiest of the morphs, but a very good deal. See, in Baker's hand, he's got a copy of Mardu Rough Rider at the ready. He also has his copy of Sword in his hand as well. Mardu Rough Rider would allow him to use all of his mana on this turn, be very mana efficient, and that's exactly what he's going to do. So does deploy that creature side by side with Unyielding Krumar. And wants the board to be as stable as possible before he deploys Soren. That's another factor here as well. If Daniel were to play Soren that turn and minus it to make a token, well, if Charles has a removal spell for the token, then the Flyer finishes off Soren. You haven't really extracted that much value out of your Planeswalker. So the Rough Rider is a very explosive play here as well, and it allows Daniel to try to wait until a better spot to deploy Soren. Of course, the Krumar can get first strike for a colorless and a white mana, but... You know, do you have that mana laying around? That is the question is. Gindy will come across here for two in the air yet again. Baker's going to go down to 16. Now Gindy's got a decision to make with the Snow Road, the Salt Road Patrol, excuse me. Does he want to maybe outlast that? Oh, boy. Or perhaps play Never a mind. very delightful rare instead. Never you mind. There's that something better to do. The High Sentinels. This is, uh, we did the deck tech yesterday with Chris Van Meter, mm -hmm. and he said that he believed this is the second best rare in the set behind We Make Rock. Okay. okay. Which is high praise, because the rock is no joke. Yeah, I said Nels Erich, and it, it is a great card in Outlast decks or without Outlast decks. It's just a fantastic four mana, three, four flyer. Great on offense, great on defense, and of course you can distribute counters as you like for four mana, three colorless, one white. And we can't forget that with Outlast, it's sorcery speed, but with this, you can activate that anytime. Yeah, this is... Just an excellent deal, super synergistic with a variety of things. And uh, Charles here facing a lot of pressure, but the High Sentinel is a good starting point of getting back in this game. Rough Rider makes it so that High Sentinels cannot block. So again, he will put a Assault Road Patrol in front of the Krumar. They'll bounce off each other. Four damage will come across. And this is a timely murderer's cut. Going to get that off of the table. I think that's a good use of that removal spell. Though, Daniel could have used that before combat. This is true. And then use the Rough Rider on Charles's one blocker left over. Get through some more damage. Get through quite a bit more damage. Gindy will draw a card now. You see the mountain in his hand. His best card maybe in his deck has been killed via Murderer's Cut. Well, there's no Wingmate Rock, so... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the best card in his deck. We'll see what the former Pro Tour champion can do here on his sixth turn of the game. Very rare to see a seal pull with only one gold card in it. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, in this format, that is a little bit surprising. You see he's got a copy of Alabaster Karen in his hand, the 2-3 Flying Vigilance. Murderer's Cut, a very powerful card, seeing it uncommon in this set. Can be cast for as little as one black mana as Kindy will deploy the Alabaster Karen and get into the red zone here for four points of damage. So maybe a bit of a racing situation as Baker's going to go down to 12. Well, there's not a lot of value in trying to unlast, uh, outlast rather, in the face of the Rough Rider. So mm -hmm. you might as well just be attacking. The Rough Rider forces Charles's hand to damage, to damage race here, unless he's willing to sit back with multiple blockers, which is really challenging to do in face of a 5 4 and a 3 3 first striker. So even though this is a bad race for Charles, I don't think he really has another option. Uh, Master Karen's going to have a tough time playing defense this turn because 
of that Rough Rider, but Gindy does have two mana available, so a card like Feet of Resistance is certainly on the radar at this point. But Baker's going to scroll through his hand again. He still has that Soren there. He's been holding that one for quite a few turns, just looking to figure out the best spot to deploy it. And it looks like it may be this turn, as he does tap four mana. Now, Feet of Resistance is something that Daniel really has to worry about here, because if Daniel goes to attack and triggers the Rough Rider, Charles can then Feet of Resistance and then block and uh, kill the 3-3. Three -three. So th that's all sorts of bad. Now, here is Soren. Solemn Visitor. So that will be the spell that Baker does deploy. And I'm looking through Charles's list here. There are zero copies of Feet of Resistance in the pool, mm -hmm. but it is one of the premier tricks in the format, something you have to be conscious of at all times, playing against an opponent with a white and a colorless up. We can't forget it's a common, too. Oh, yeah. So it's very realistic for Guinea to actually have this card, even though he has no copies of it in his sealed pool. So Sworn's going to start at four. Elevator's going up to five. So until next turn, Daniel Baker's creatures will have plus one, plus zero, oh, and lifelink. That means on Gindy's turn as well. And here is the attack. Alabaster Karen cannot block. And so if Gindy had some interest in racing, well, Soren's lifelink is going to turn that off. Most likely, Charles is going to be able to kill the Soren on the way back. But even this huge lifelink swing, plus compelling Gindy to attack with a bunch of stuff next turn, is, is a good exchange for Daniel. Daniel's attack for that turn is for 10. So Gindy will take 10. Baker will gain 10. And back to Gindy we go. See the life totals here, 22 to 8 in favor of Baker. Baker's got the best card on the table. And I think the better board too, Patrick. Absolutely. And if Daniel has something like, you know, let's say Mardu Charm this turn to protect Soren, that might lock up the game here. Gindy going to look through his hand. You can see the island there. The rest of the content's kind of hidden at this point. He got up to a really nice start here. The High Sentinels was a great play on turn five. But that got taken care of via Murderous Cut. And now Guinea's definitely got his back against the wall. The Martyr Rough Riders look very, very good in this game, too. It's it's super powerful. I think it's a, a, a bit of a slept-on card, uh, in part because the Martyr decks, you know, going up to five mana isn't necessarily something you want to be doing all the time. But its its impact on the board is enormous. I don't know what, what that Rough Rider is riding. I, maybe I just shouldn't ask. That thing looks mad. Yeah. I wouldn't want to block that if I had the choice. But some, I don't want, I don't want some to Some Jurassic for you. Park action right yeah, there. Absolutely. Gindy looks like, all right, we're going to turn them, I believe, all sideways here. Albasker does have Vigilance, of course, so that one is not going to tap. Sorn is going to bite the dust. He's got to get that off the table. That's very important for him to do. Looks like he's going to play an island. Tap a little bit of mana here. I'll deploy the Jeskai Elder before passing the turn back. So this allows. Gindy to chump block this turn because he has two blockers back on defense, uh, assuming Daniel has no removal spell. But again, the damage race is just shaping up so poorly right now. I mean, can't forget, because Jessica Elder does have prowess, Gindy can get a little bit tricksky. But he's just going to have to block with his Alabaster Cairn so he doesn't die. He'll take three points of damage. Let's see what Baker has in the second main phase. That's a pretty good one there. The Abzan Battle Priest. Mm -hmm. Gindy will untap here with two cards in his hand. He'll draw a card for the turn. So he will now have three. You do see the Battle Priest here, four mana, three, two. Outlast for just a single white mana. Each creature you control the plus one, plus one counter on it does have lifelink. It does sit at uncommon. Not the best Outlast creature. I think that goes to Abzan Falconer, but still quite good. Well, Battle Priest can be one of the most important parts of the deck when you have a lot of Outlast going on because yes. it makes combat impossible. In isolation, it's not that efficient. The Jeskai Elder is going to come in here, I think, with the intention of, hey, can I hit you, please, so I can draw a discard? And Gindy will get to do that, so he will draw a card. Mantis Rider is what he's found. He's got to discard a card here before he can move forward. And that might have been a pure bluff attack on Gindy's side, knowing that he was dead on board based on what was in his hand. Had to hope that Daniel would not block, and then he would have an opportunity to loot into something that could help him out. Three mana here for Gindy. He will deploy his Mantis Rider. The old post-combat Manus Rider. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of sad to see, but it is what it is. Back to Baker, we will go. And that's the timely Horde Mate. Nothing in Gindy's graveyard to cut back. Only gets back two or lesses, so the, the Sentinels and the Alabaster Leech cannot come back. I'm sure he would love to get that back, the old Sentinels, but he's unable to do that. 
Horde Maid looks to be a pretty good card, though. I mean, this is one of those cards, again, when you're attacking with raid, what's my opponent trying to accomplish? Are they trying to raid me? Are they bluffing with their attack? Do they actually have a trick? Maybe yes, maybe no. As you see, Baker cast the Chief of the Edge. That's the one that puts Warriors plus one, plus oh, not plus oh, plus one. So the attack here will be a little bit stronger here for Baker. Giddy's List does have a fair number of two drops, but again, he, he missed on his two copies of Antioch Bondkin early on in the game. Now, one thing that you have to do if you're Gindy and Baker in this circumstance is you have to do, have to do kind of the, the warrior check for the creatures that he does have in the battlefield. Of course, the battle priest is a human cleric, so that is not one of them. But the Mardu are flush. Yes, quite a few warriors. I think that's why people really like to move towards that archetype for draft. If you can get some Chief of the Edges, you can really kill your opponent very, very quickly as Gindy's going to have to try to make some blocks here. The Oops. warrior enablers in this set are the real deal. Yes. I mean, I know it's not a tribal set explicitly, but... Those cards are, the Warrior Enablers are extremely good. Yeah, the Rough Riders are 6-4 in the attack right now. It looks like the Rough Rider made it to the Salt Road Patrol. Cannot block. So the 2-4 is going to have to get out of here. Gindy's going to attempt a double block here. It looks like it's going to work out okay. He's going to lose both his creatures. But the Rough Rider's off the table. I think that's actually pretty important here for Charles. It's step one. Let's see what Baker has to do. Just a little outlast action. So that's going to take its way up to a 3-4 now. Or excuse me, a 4-3 but it does have lifelink. Gindy will draw a card. He's a two life. And it looks like maybe just Mantis Rider. Yeah. He's got to still hold back as much as possible. Let's see what the follow-up's going to be. Just guy wind scout. And Gindy will pass the turn back. Can he stabilize that two life? Well, he's got the, the, first, stri the first striker covered. It looks and like I see a Mardu charm here. And actually, it looks like we're going to use that. We'll see. So you do have to select a mode on that card. Now, of course, Mardu Charm is a card that does have three modes on it for damage to deal. Just, excuse me, four damage to start a creature. You can put two one and white warrior tokens into play, and the target opponent reveals his or her hand a Duresque-esque effect. Again, this is an instant, so we'll see exactly what did happen here. So I think that Daniel might have said Mardu Charm you meaning deal four damage to you. Now, Mardu Charm does not have that mode. Jeskai Charm does. That's correct. Charles may be arguing, well... Mardu Charm does have a mode that allows him to target me. It is the third mode. So if he said Mardu Charm me, maybe he's locked in, and it looks like the judge is allowing Daniel to go back and actually just kill the thing you want to kill. Yeah, the Mantis Rider's going to bite the dust, and now Baker's going to come in with all of his creatures. So Gindy, of course, has to do some blocking so that he does not die this turn, as this is a lethal attack. So we'll see how he does elect to block. It looks like the Wind Scout's going to go on the Chief of the Edge, Assault World Patrol over there on the Krumar. And now the Jeskai Elder in front of the Battle Priest. Gindy will lose some creatures. Baker will barely lose anything. And Baker is still ahead. And see if he has a creature to follow up with. And he does. And that's actually going to rebuy wow. something. That's a beautiful turn. His horde mate was a little bit better than Gindy's, that's yeah, for sure. That's, you're not wrong about that. And Gindy will pack it up and pack it in. Daniel Baker is going to win game number one here over Charles Gindy. His Mardu Seal deck looking pretty good against Gindy's Jeskai deck thus far. Yeah, the... The Rough Rider and the Murderous Cut, the biggest factors, but his rank and file cards in that game were very good as well. Now, what makes it kind of limited interesting is normally, you know, what we do now is we take a look at the sideboards for the constructed decks and say, okay, here are the 15 cards that these players have access to, and I imagine they will bring these cards in and sideboard these cards out, but for limited, sideboarding is a whole different animal. Well, you're, you rarely have, you know, these bombs that we're bringing in against your opponent. You know, there's, there's things like in M15, you have some Fester Glooms in your sideboard, you bring it against the guy with triplicate spirits, and that can be really powerful. But uh, there aren't really the same volume of super powerful sideboard cards in this format. There aren't color haters or, or anything along those lines. So normally when you're making sideboarding, it's I either need to speed up my deck because my opponent's deck is a lot more powerful, I need to be putting in quality blockers, I need to be removing my blockers because my opponent is just a pure control deck. You're making those kind of sideboard swaps for the most part. And you see, both players are going to go to the sideboard. And one, one thing that's really interesting is, you know, a lot of Magic players tell you, you know what, more of your games are with your sideboard than they are without them. And in Constructed, that plays a huge role because you can bring in huge haymakers, you know, gain, say, against the blue deck, circle protection red against a red deck. You know, we, we know about all these great, fantastic cards that we see in Constructed sideboards for limited. You know, more often than not, you're going to bring in some pretty fringy cards that have a minor effect. But in this particular format, because the format's so slow, I think that you can bring in these minor effects because the likelihood of you actually having time to draw and find and use them is actually much higher than most limited formats. Yeah, the games just drag out. So bring in more expensive cards, bring in situational cards, a little bit more justifiable in the sealed format than I feel in most. 
You saw both players go to the drawing board there for a little bit. Looks like they move, may have moved in a card or two. But sideboarding in limited is, is difficult for so many reasons. One, you know, you haven't even seen your entire your opponent's entire deck. So you don't even know what they have even have access to. You know, that's a different that's a very difficult thing. But two, sideboarding out cards limited, that's no easy thing to do. Well, you you know, if you have some uh, often I've had seal pools where I'm happy with let's say twenty one of the cards my last two playables are sort of fringy. And let's say I feel that my deck is aggressive and the last two playables I'm playing are things that help facilitate the aggressive side of the deck. And then in matchups where that's not really what's going on, where the games are going to bog down, or for whatever reason I don't feel like I can just beat my opponent out of the gate that quickly, then those fringe playables will get swapped out for some slower cards. And we'll see if at some point, because this has certainly happened, if we see the full-blown color swap, you know, maybe some players to feel like, okay, I built my deck incorrectly. I've got to do the full swap -a here. You know, that's definitely a thing that happens. I don't know if it's going to happen that much in this particular format, but we will see. Some players definitely are going to say, you know what, I have to sleep up my other deck, go back to the drawing board and find a different configuration. And as odd as it sounds, I have seen players have a lot of success with that. I have seen, you know, Paul Rietzel, I remember at Grand Prix Seattle Tacoma, about two or three years ago, he started off the tournament. He three buys, of course. It's Paul. Uh, starts off 0-2, and, and he's just sitting at a table after he lost all by himself. And he looks a little bit, you know, upset, you know, not really sure what's happened so far in this tournament. He's just sitting there. I'm like, well, what are you doing? He's just like, I'm 0-2. I'm pretty sure I built my deck wrong, and I need to figure out what I can do because I do not want to get a third loss and just be out of the tournament before it even began. And he figured out a configuration that worked for him. He ran off the necessary ones to make day two. I think he ended up catching the tournament, a tribute to why he's such a great player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes you have to go back to the drawing board. You know, and in this format, I think that's less likely to happen because most of your seal pools will allow you to play kind of all the stuff that you want to. So there's rarely going to be the ability or the justification for a full reboot on your seal pool because so much, no matter how you configure your deck, you're going to be playing your best elements because of the, the gold nature, the three or four color nature of the format. So both players do shuffle and present. Gindy will have the option. Normally I would say that Gindy will play first, but we are also in a limited format. It is sealed. A lot of players opt to draw first. Well, I think Gindy's list looks like he's trying to capitalize on the slower decks of the format. There's a lot of two drops. He has the Leaping Master. He has two cops, copies of the Anarch Bonkin that I mentioned before as well. He has his Just Guy Elder. So his deck feels like he's trying to capitalize on the fact that many people aren't playing anything until turn three. And often what they are playing on turn three is a banner or a morph. So he's trying to, I think he's going to play with this pool. I think there's going to be a lot of seal pools that draw today. But Gindy's feels on the aggressive side. Even though we saw things like the Salt Road Patrol, more defensive creatures, you, you can't play just 23 two drops in most of your seal pools. So you're going to have to have some of the more controlling, more clunky cards. But his is definitely one of the more aggressive seal pools in the format that I've seen. Baker going to send his hand back. He's going to go down to six. We'll see if he can find a six that he does like here in just a bit. But I think that's another just discussion that we talked about kind of at the top, how many decisions and how players are kind of split on what you're supposed to do in this particular format. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, talking to one player, if they just had Gindy's pool in their hand, would you play or draw first with the deck? I think one player would say play. I think another player would say draw. I think that you would only say draw if you felt that every seal pool was supposed to draw because mm -hmm. of the format, which may be the case. I don't know. But. There are some players out there who just draw no matter what the format is, too. That Those players do exist where it's just like, I want the extra card. Mm -hmm. If my opponent mulligans a six, I'm so far ahead. You know, th that might be the world that we live in for this format. Again, who knows? It is true. Uh, I do feel like when your opponent... When you're playing sealed and your opponent mulligans on the play, they are in a ton of trouble almost no matter what. You so feel even, pretty good. Even if you are inclined to play, the sweetness of getting that mulligan sometimes uh, pushes people towards drawing. Both players are going to start at 21 here as Kitty had a wind scarred crag. That is the red and white one that will gain a life. And then you saw the jungle hollow there from Baker. Now he's going to change up his man a little bit here with a swift water cliffs. So he's got four colors of mana just to start. Yeah, this is, a, this is a different start than what we saw last year. Huge deviation from the opening that we saw last game. Yeah, this is kind of crazy here. Gindy's going to come across for two here. And again, this is kind of what this format's all about, where both players are going to start the game at 21 or 22. So for aggressive decks, it seems very, very hard to get something done as Gindy's going to play a morph here after the attack. Yeah, this owned ancestor from Daniel there. That's, a, that's the type of card where if it wasn't in his main deck, I would have sided it in for this matchup. Yeah. Gindy, you saw it with the Leaping Master, is what he attacked for two with. Daniel, going to play a Plains. 
play the 1-1. One, one, kind of a typhoid rat there for Baker. The Mardu hate the lead. Yeah. A little on morph action. We up saw this in the last game. <laughs> this, is, this is a start that we saw in the last game. You see the watch of the roost. Gindy's going to reveal the high sentinels. Giddy will gain two life. He's up to 23. Now he's got the 3-4. And now again, Baker had the murderer's cut last game. Doesn't have the necessary mana for it this game, especially because he doesn't have a card in the graveyard. And this is such a good opening for Charles because Daniel's got the ground locked up oh, with yeah. his ancestor and his hate blade. Attacking on the ground is going to be a very challenging thing to do. And now his, his uh, attacking squad is potentially all in the air. He's willing to sink mana into the Leaping Master. The hate blade can definitely hold down the ground with one black mana which baker does have available but guinea might just say hey let's go to the skies and talking to a lot of players this weekend already they said going to the skies is where you want to be in this format because uh, charles has the option of just ignoring the ground defenses i think that he's not going to ever trade with this Mardu hate blade if he can avoid it what's more likely to happen is the turns where he doesn't want to commit mana into leaping master he's simply not going to attack with it mm -hmm. and then the turns where he can he will activate leaving master's ability and just fly over the hate blade see baker is going to give this some thought i think guinea may consider activating the high sentinels here too we'll see what he wants to do on this fifth turn of the game. Yeah, if, if Charles is debating whether or not he wants to activate the High Sentinels or add something to the ground, even though it's not that mana efficient, he may err on the side of just pumping into the High Sentinel because Daniel, again, has the ground pretty effectively covered at this point. Mardu Horde Chief will happen after combat. Of course, the Ray Trigger has occurred, so going to get a 1-1 with that as well. Baker will play his fifth land. You can see the Sorn that he has, but Sorn is not very safe right now nope. on this board. It's no good. He can generate a token, but... Uh, it's pretty simple for Charles to simply attack Soren, take it out, and that's not great value out of your, you know, marquee planeswalker. Also in Baker's hand, he does have a copy of Soul Tie Scavenger. That's the six mana three three flyer with Delve. Again, he doesn't have the ability to use that though. You see, Gindy's going to very quickly activate the High Sentinels, and say, "Hey, I want to counter on my creature." Gindy not really even playing around a card here like Kill Shot. It doesn't seem. But I might just say, hey, I can't even try to play around kill shot. I'm just going to try to do my thing, and if you have the answer, that's life. Got nothing else to do. I like putting the counter there on the nine non-high sentinels to try to diversify a little bit. If Daniel does have a removal spell there, you don't want it getting loaded up on your one high quality threat. Try to make as many as many good creatures in play as possible to hedge against removal spells. And speak of the devil, and it shall appear Baker's draw for the turn was a kill shot. So he hit, he does have one of those. Just a common removal spell. We didn't have one on, on the previous turn, so I can't imagine Gideon's going to try to play around it on this turn. Though, maybe I should give the Pro Tour champ a little more credit. Though, uh, on the other hand, you know, Daniel's at six. Charles is in a position where he can just activate Leaping Master, and even if Daniel does have a kill spell for the High Sentinels, it's not the end of the world. This is true. Gindy will untap and draw a card. And uh, keep in mind, Gindy is doing this all without blue mana, and yep. his hand appears to be basically all blue cards. He will activate the Leaping Master, so that will get flying until end of turn. So a 2-1 in the air, along with the Watcher of the Roost, which is a 3-2. And then the High Sentinels, of course, is a 3-4. That one draws the most attention. That will take the kill shot. So that goes immediately to the graveyard. But as you mentioned, five damage is going to come across in the air, unless Baker has something else here. So Baker's going to go down to one. He does have the ground locked down, but... Not doing great in the air as he draws a copy of Mardu Charm. And he has enough mana to both play Sorin and Mardu Charm, one of Gindy's flyers. Okay. So I do believe this at least temporarily stabilizes the board. So that was, that was the draw. Well, looks like he's just going to pass the turn back. Maybe he doesn't find that sequence of events like you did. I think, I, I think he was just asking Charles how many cards were in his hand. Okay. The answer is five. Probably at least three of them blue. Yeah. <laughs> no Mantis Rider yet this game for Gindy. Does not have the blue mana. But yeah, uh, Daniel has seven mana, and he has the appropriate colored mana to do all of this. Looks like he's going to cast that Mardu Charm. But what I actually think he can do is he can play Mardu Charm to kill something and then play Soul Tide Scavenger because it doesn't seem as though Soren is great on this particular board. Yes, you can give your creatures plus one, plus one lifelink, but they're going to be running in basically into the abyss at this point. For sure. So, yes, if he has Soul Tide Scavenger as the last card, although he doesn't have enough mana, right? Because He that's... has four and then a kill shot. Oh, the, the kill Mardu shot. I did not... In the yeah, bin, yeah. His graveyard's off screen, yep. so that's why I missed it. So he gets to use all of his mana for the turn. Get the 3 3 flyer out there. Now it's on Guinea to maybe draw a blue source or removal spell to be able to crush through this. And he does have one. He will bring it low. And that uh, 
That 1-1 one, one is able to sneak across for the last point of damage. Oh, how about that 1-1? One, one? <laughs> Perfect. How about that? Just like you drew it there is There is nothing in Magic more satisfying than a game of limited where you get your opponent to exact zero. That is, that is the sweetness right there. You know, I, I was gonna I was gonna disagree, but I just you're right. Actually, you're just right. Bring low was the removal spell that Gindy cleared the way with there in the last term. One of the best removal spells in the format, especially when it involves you know, Gindy playing a Mardu Horde Chief that didn't look like it was gonna play much of an impact in the uh -huh. game because Daniel had the ground locked up to such an extent, and to have that token just sneak across for the last point. Get you that mm. la get you that last one. Thank you much. I miss tournament magic sometimes. <laughs> Charles. It's the little things. It's the little things, you know? Charles going to get it even it up here against Daniel Baker. And a third game is where we are heading here between these Just Guy and Mardu sealed decks. Don't, I, I don't need, you know, the trophies or the big checks. Just give me that exact lethal. <laughs> Wall color screwed. Mmm. <laughs> Mm, mm, mm. That tastes good. You want out of the booth? You want to see if we can get you to the tournament still? I can, <laughs> I can talk to some people. Can I get a round one loss? And then yeah, absolutely. Oh, you, get you've there? got a round one loss. All right. If you are just joining us, Star City Games bringing you guys Grand Prix Orlando. Hashtag GP Orlando at SCG Live for your tweets all weekend long. We've got nine rounds of steel action for you guys today, and we do want questions and your thoughts on this brand new limited format that Concept Arc here has brought with us. And even though Patrick and I have done some preparation on you know, cards name, card names and playing steel deck and booster drafts, we're looking to learn the format just like you guys are, just like the players playing in the Pro Tour next weekend in Honolulu, just like all 2,300 players who were here in attendance this weekend. Even though we all have our opinions on how we think things will go, it's very hard to say in this very decision-laden format. Who knows? It, it, it's, it's a tough format to play and to build steel decks in, for sure. It's just tough everything. It is tough everything. I think this is going to be the set that may uh, reinvigorate my interest in playing Magic Online, which is my most my source for Magic at this point. There was a little bit of a lull, you know, M15 Limited didn't really matter anymore. Uh, Standard didn't really matter anymore because we were just sort of waiting for the rotation. But so far, what I've played of cons, I've really enjoyed, and I would like to get to experience more of it. I am looking forward to playing this format quite a bit. Got a little booster box at home. Going to build some more sealed decks when I get back to Seattle. It's just a really, really cool format. I just like the, I like the decisions and the difficulty of it. It's really, really sweet. Now this, look at this guy, the old blood-soaked champion to start things up here in game number three. Not a bad place to be with the 2-1. To uh, On the play? Uh, yes, this yeah. is one of the better openings. I can't block, of course, but it certainly can't attack, and that's what it's going to do. In for two here. Guinea goes down to 18. He's under the gun right away. Though, in an odd way, this may be one of Daniel's least uh, impactful cards in the matchup because he is the control deck in this matchup. This is true. And playing a creature that can't block. Uh, now, this is super good. I'm not saying you should have sided it out or, or whatever the case, but uh, if this was a control-on-control control type of matchup, this could be an incredible opening. Just Guy Elder there for Gindy. This is exactly what he played on turn number two. You saw the attack for two from Daniel Baker. And then Baker plays the Jeskai Guy student. Of course, that's the one three. Now, Gindy's going to reach for his one two prowess creature. He says, you know what? I'm coming to the red zone. I dare you to block. Eh, all right, Jeskai Guy student. It looks like it will block. Does Gindy have a trick is the question. Nope, just a morph. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's you know, there's no way that, that Gindy's blocking with his elder next turn. Mm -hmm. And so the attack is free because maybe Daniel just says, okay, no blocks, and you get to loot. It's a low chance, but stranger things have happened. Boats are champion going to come across for two more. Guinea's going to go down to 14, and there's the Horde Chief. So give me that token that, that Guinea won with last time. So Charles sort of avoided disaster there because Daniel did not have a fourth land for the sword in his hand, but this is still a, a very, very good opening. Let's see what Guinea can do here on the fourth turn of the game. He's got some catching up to do. There is the fourth land. He's got all three colors of mana. Did have all three colors last game, but didn't need it. In this game, he has all three colors, and it may not be good enough. Mm -hmm. You can see Daniel moving that sword to the top of his hand. I mean, he's hoping to draw his land. land number four here. There's another morph there for Gindy. That's morph number two. Baker draws a card. It is not a land. It is a very expensive removal spell instead. Not the best draw there for Daniel. Picked up a copy of Right of the Serpent that he sideboarded in. Not a great draw here. Yeah. 
And I would not be a huge fan of right of the serpent in this matchup. Again, Indy's showing that he's kind of. I mean, I understand you want more answers to high sentinel. That's, yeah, that's, gotta have one. That's reasonable, but I still feel like you know the way that Gindy's going to beat you in these games is by getting underneath you. And six man is a lot to play for a removal spell. If it's not targeting high sentinels, you know, you're probably not happy with drawing it. Here's the attack from Baker. Gindy's going to go in the tank here. You see the Bloodsoak Champion and the Mardu Horde Chief are coming in, but what actually makes this a little bit compelling to me is I think Gindy can pick up some information here because if Baker had a spell, I think that that Jeskai student would be attacking. Possibly, though there is an argument for leaving something back on defense that can uh, comfortably check the Jeskai Elder because letting Gindy loot here is not that good. That's so true. I think that... Uh, you know, you don't want to put yourself into a position where you're compelled to use a combat trick inside inside of combat because Gindy could simply double block the student with the two morphs and put Daniel to the test right away. See, Gindy's just going to take the damage. He uses life totals and resources. He goes to go down to 10. He's the one with the lands, though, as he plays his fifth one. So two islands, two planes, and a mountain in play. And he's just going to pass the turn back yet again. However, that's five mana, and that's the flashpoint for morphs. Now, again, there's no uh, a free weapon master in Gindy's deck here. But the only gold card is the Mantis Rider, but... Baker doesn't know that. No, he does not. He has to respect it. I mean, that would be the, the first card on my radar. Bloodsoaked Champion. Gindy's going to unmorph with his Mammoth right away. He's going to eat that Bloodsoaked Champion. He's not scared. Got the War Behemoth. You know what I like to, that when people unmorph mar big martial morphs to kill creatures in combat? The sound I like to make? <laughs> <laughs> There, that is that is the ultimate. <laughs> right there is that guy, the old war behemoth. Just that three six, th three six, kind of boring creature, but it's gonna hold the road. Clunky, but good enough in this spot. Well, I imagine what Gindy's plan here this game is. All right, I've got the ground kind of locked up now with this three six. Got a morph out there. Got my Jeskai Elder. Let's get in the skies again, like last game. That's the way he wants to win. And it's especially important for him to do it again because. Uh, Daniel has Soren in hand, and Giddy's aware of that card's in his deck, so mm -hmm. the more that he can establish some, some base of operations in the air, the more likely he is to be able to fight this Planeswalker. So now here's a Horde Chief for Gindy, so he will get a Warrior token as well. You saw Baker last turn. Well, he did gain a life from his Swiftwater Cliffs. So now he's got four mana. He's got red mana now, too, for his Mardu deck. Now the question is, does he want to deploy Soren? You saw Gindy also deploy a banner before kicking the turn back. So if Daniel were to deploy Soren and Minus, let's say, then he has five creatures against the five on the other side of the table, but he's likely to be forced into bad blocks. Mm -hmm. If he plays Soren and pluses it, it's 5v4, but the blocks that Daniel has access to next turn are much juicier. Because... Plus one, plus so for right. the duration. Although he's actually only five versus three or five versus four because the Blood So Champion can't block. So this still may not be a stable enough board for Daniel to deploy Soren. It still feels like he's short. Decisions. And this is, this is a real decision here for Baker. And he, you know, you see he's tapping the three mana. And he's going to cast a little Arc Lightning action. Now that is pretty nice. Arc Lightning, yeah, not exactly a two for one, but it does kill two creatures, which is more important. And Kenny revealing another of these marginal monocolor common morphs in the Antioch Tracker. Yep, just a 3-3 first striker, but it's in the graveyard. I imagine Gindy would like to have that in play. For Art Lightning kind of clearing things up here for Baker, making his Soren a little bit better if he can get some stuff out of the way. Gindy's going to sacrifice the banner. He needs a little bit of help. And this is part of the issue I discussed with Bloodsoak Champion. I mean, having it on turn one on the play was great, but now the game's gotten to a spot where that card is barely a card. It's almost a liability at this point. Yeah, it's it's not doing very much. Now, Gindy has a 10, that's great, but if Daniel wins the game, it's likely to be by leveraging superior resources and not by getting in these little chip shots and getting Gindy down to exact zero. Not saying it can't happen, but of it's, course. it's less likely than it is for Daniel to be deploying his Soren and, and trying to win the games that way. Gindy going to play a morph after sacrificing the banner and passing the turn back. Considered attacking with the War Behemoth there briefly, but decided it might be a little bit better to hold this back on defense. So back to Baker we will go. Doesn't look like he's drawn a fifth land. Not entirely sure if he needs one, though. Typically true of the War <laughs> of the uh, war Behemoth is better on defense than offense. Let's just hold steady, big guy. <laughs> hold steady. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't... Don't get ahead of yourself there, man. He likes defense. Yeah. Why don't you just graze? <laughs> don't, 
don't rush in there, you know? Baker gonna tap some mana. It's time for Soren. Enough playing around. I'm playing the best card in my deck. I'm gonna see if you can beat it. Gonna make a 2-2 Vampire. So it's 4v4 on the blocks right now. But there's no clean answer in play to the War Behemoth. So that's at least one free attack. I, I think Daniel's probably likely to lose some amount of his board this turn. And if Guinea has any sort of tricks, Daniel gets too aggressive trying to protect the Soren. It could be a, a horrible turn for Daniel. Yeah, how highly does he value Soren? That's the situ you know, that's kind of the situation that we're in right now. This is a bring low. That is going to reveal a watch of the roost. The card that he's revealing is a dazzling rampant. So in for two, that's going to bite the dust. It's a good turn. Yeah, that's the easiest way. You know, the, the more harrowing thing for, for Gideon is trying to slog through the ground to get to that sword. And this is much better. And it puts a fire into play, which, as the board currently stands, Daniel can't answer. And if Gideon can get the ramparts into play, of course, that's the 05 wall that you can tap a creature for one in a white, and you have to tap it, of course. You know, then he's got some nice defense on the ground. And, and again, this format, you're going to get a lot of you know, ground stalls. It's if you can get in the air like we saw last game with Gindy, you know, with the Watch of the Roost and the High Sentinels. He's got a Watch of the Roost right now. He took care of the sword, and now he can get to work on Daniel Baker's life total. Though, to be fair, Baker, because he hasn't been playing lands, he's got a lot of spells in his hand. Yeah, and this is actually shaping up to be a game where Daniel just drew end hostilities, mm -hmm. and Gindy has not seen it yet. And Daniel's been playing spells the whole game. And he's been missing land drops. So I, I think there's an almost 0% chance Gindy respects the possibility of end hostilities in this game. And that, I, I mean, you're saying he's emptying out here. Yep. If Daniel's able to find land number five here in time with the leftovers he has in hand, which, which are significant, uh, Gindy might just get completely blown away by end hostilities. And we have seen in previous limited formats where the wrath effects have not been all that great. They've been mediocre, um, not particularly difficult to play around. You know, in Theros, for example, oh, sure, Wrath Name, I bestow creatures will come back and, you know, all that jazz. But in hostilities, especially in this format, we've got these long, drawn-out games where you just, get me, let me get my stuff out there. And, and look, Giddy's in... Giddy's on empty right now. Yeah. I mean, this is, if he loses this board, I mean, that's it. Yeah, there's the fifth land. He can't cast end hostilities fast enough. He draws the fifth land. All of Gindy's creatures are going to die. And sure, Daniel Baker's creatures are going to die. But and you see Gindy, a little bit of frustration there. But is he going to play around the Wrath Effect? No, but I think he may have just drawn a copy of High Sentinels of Arshan. I'm not positive. But you see him looking through the graveyard, kind of the deep breath there. He knows he's in trouble. He moved in as I would, too. I'm not really going to play around a rare in that situation. No way. And I think Giddy's a little frustrated because Daniel didn't even do the token Alpha Strike before I play my See Squeaver. if I can get some damage yeah, through. Maybe, maybe get a point. Yeah. No, it's just, I'm going to play my fifth land. I'm going to slam down in hostilities. And this is a player, as you can see right now, who knows he's in a lot of trouble. I, I mean, Daniel's missed land drops. You know, he whole, you know he's got a, a lot left over here. Now, Gindy's draw was a good one. That might be the best draw in his deck in this situation. Now, there's the sixth land. However, for Baker... He does not have a second black mana for Rite of the Serpent. That's the removal spell that he wants to cast to get the High Sentinels off the table. Now, Soltai Scavenger is going to come into play. He can delve as much as he wants to. Looks like he's going to delve five, make, that, make sure that only costs one black mana. Now, Baker has overcome just about everything. He's just got to overcome this one last threat. And this has to be a relief for Kindy because I think the card he was most worried about there was Murderous Cut. Yes. And if Daniel is playing a Soltai Scavenger instead of just using Murderous Cut, you know you're in the clear from that, of course. Now, Kill Shot, you know, Smite the Monstrous, whatever. There's other things that can go wrong here, but the most obvious one, uh, Charles can be pretty confident, is not in Daniel's hands. Yeah, this is a situation if you're Kindy. Are you going to try to play around Kill Shot in this instance? Do you even have a choice? You know, I don't know. It's, you know, he can't really block the Mardu Hate Blade in this spot. Yep. And Daniel still has a handful of spells. I mean, he can just try to wall up here. But I don't know what the long-term plan is against a kill shot if there's one there. Now, he still may want to just, you know, activate the high sentinels two more times and then start racing. Or if Daniel deploys a lot of powerful creatures next turn, maybe he sits back on defense the whole way through. So he may sit back for one turn just to gain some information about exactly what's going on in Daniel's hand. He sit back one more turn. That's one more draw step for the opponent to maybe find that second black resource or that murderous cut, all that stuff. So it's a real decision. He says, you know what? I'm not going to play on the kill shot. He's moving in. Yep, this is it. He's moving in right now. It's going to be a double activation on the high on the high sentinels. It's going to be an attack for six. There's a second black mana, and that means a rise of the serpent can be cast, and that means that Daniel Baker's also going to get a snake token because the high sentinels 
has a counter on it. So a snake token should be coming for him in just a moment. And for Daniel Baker, probably the biggest problem has just been solved. I, I would be shocked if Gindy could recover from this state. His deck is not that objectively powerful. It's more tempo oriented. Uh, Daniel still with two cards left over in hand. Now, I'm not sure if there's any, again, there's no Jeskai charm in Gindy's list as we've established. I don't think there's a lot in terms of reach. So I don't think he can realistically win the game from this spot. See, the life totals here are 12 to 6. Baker's going to quickly untap. He draws a copy of Kill Shot, so he would have found an answer regardless. That's got to be the insurance policy, yeah. you know. There is the Mighty Water Whirl. That's going to pick up two creatures. Oh, excuse me, that's a Crippling Chill. I take that back. That'll tap down one. And we'll stay tapped. And, of course, Gindy will get the cantrip off of that. Going to get the Blood Soak Champion back there with Raid. But this shows the power of Wrath Effects and Limited, especially in this particular limited format. Guinea's going to play Assault Road Patrol, try to turtle up a little bit here, but I don't think that's going to work the way that he would like it to. The Salt Eye Scavenger, of course, is not going to untap because of Crippling Shield. It'll untap on the next turn, assuming we make it there. There is a Jungle Hollow. Baker will go up to seven. You see Guinea's at six right now. He's got two lands in his hand. The writing is basically on the wall here. Baker can tread a little bit carefully, but it looks like this game is going to be his, Patrick. I, I, you know, it's going to be challenging. It, the question now is, does he alpha strike or does he just only send in the hate blade? It looks like he's going to alpha. He'll get in four points of damage across. He'll play the unyielding crew mark. Gindy's going to draw a card. He doesn't have a card like end hostilities to draw like Baker does. And having that reset button is so very powerful. And that's why Daniel Baker is 1-0 here in Orlando. Defeats Pro Tour Hollywood champion Charles Gindy, two games to one, Mardu over Jeskai, and what was a very entertaining three-game match. And, and Hostilities is so good in this format because, you know, there's times where your opponent, you're playing games of limited, and get, turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four, they're not playing anything, and in the back of your head, the possibility of whatever the sweeper is starts to register. In this format, because the control decks are able to play morphs and unmorph them, and sort of allow you to get ahead a little bit on the board, but keep their head above water, and more importantly, keep up the appearances that they're trying to play to the board. Uh, often people get to the spot where they just empty out their entire hand because they're trying to overpower the morphs before the control deck takes over, and then os and hostilities ends the game. And that's a about what we saw there. It wasn't really the morphs that were facilitating for Daniel. It was some amount of his, his land screw, but he was still playing enough stuff that even though and hostilities ended up being very powerful for him, it wasn't obvious to Giddy that that was a card he was trying to set up. Mm -hmm. And when the format plays out like that, the sweepers are incredibly powerful. Yeah, oddly enough, you know, Soren is obviously a great card in the limited format, but Soren is like kind of the perfect card to kind of set up the end hostilities with. I'm deploying something that's not going to die to end hostilities. You want to get that off the table, of course. 